in the Belgorod region of Russia, you've had a, a couple of major developments as well that have that are changing the character of this war. Uh, and and the first, and we have uh, footage. We have footage of this too. Yes. So so there was a so the shooting. Uh, uh, and we'll go to the we'll go to the footage in a second. So this was a a mass shooting mm -hmm. carried out at a training center. Now, uh, the the Ru Russian the Russian government has been explicit in trying to say that these were all uh, recruits and volunteers. These are not draftees. They don't want the impression out there that these are people who have been conscripted into the war and as soon as they get to the training center, start shooting people full Metal Jacket style. Right. Now, take that with a grain of salt. Like, uh, these very well could have been uh, conscripts. What they're also saying is that they were, these were t uh, Tajiki men, you know, who were, who were uh, at, which, which plays into the kind of uh, ethno-nationalism that is at the heart of Putinism, saying that these are kind of you know, outsiders and others who are, who are attacking the motherland or something all along those lines. Uh, but what you have is at, at least 11, you know, that's what they're admitting to. Mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, soldiers who are supposed to be getting trained and during a live fire drill, uh, these, these two men just turned on everybody, just start, start blowing them away. Uh, so uh, what, what was your reaction when you start? Because, you know, ever see a mass shooting, you're like, oh, that's a United States story. Well, uh, I mean, it's. I, I want to ask you on that point what this says about. Actually, you you mentioned this just a couple of moments ago earlier about uh, Putin's sort of new messaging campaign for his own country mm -hmm. about what this war is about, um, especially as he is having to rely on sending conscripts into war and kind of you know going to Iran. All of these these different strategies. To you, what does this say about his ability to like really seriously carry that out? Which, I mean, clearly he sees that as a central aspect of his strategy, being able to muster this, this nationalism um, yeah. as, a, as a, a weapon, really, a, a massive weapon um, in terms of morale. It, there's a contradiction in it because he is relying on the kind of outer regions, mm -hmm. uh, the, the other ethnicities within inside uh, the Russian Federation to make up a disproportionate share, just like we do here in the United States, of his of his military. So he, he he's trying to have it both ways, and it's and it's not going to work. I think this mobilization, I think, is going to be is going to prove to be disastrous for him because, as uh, has been talked about by a number of different commentaries, what what Putin, what what was so successful for Putin over several decades of his rule was mass demobilization was to make a contract with the Russian people that says there's going to be a significant level of security, stability, uh, both economic and, uh, and just crime. And you know, where I'm gonna cut down on crime, I'm gonna cut down on economic insecurity. Uh, you're, you're gonna have pride in your country again. And in exchange, the deal is basically don't worry about politics. Mm -hmm. Like don't run candidates against me. I, you know, they'll be kicked off the ballot or they'll be jailed or they'll be killed. Uh, and, and then we'll be cool. Like that was the deal. And so that, that, that is demobilization. And so to mobilize the entire country on behalf of a, a, what is now unmistakably a war, which he spent so many months saying is just a, a special military operation, uh, it then undoes the entire bargain that has, that has kept him in power. And you have to think, why did he call it a special military operation if he thought this was going to be popular? And one of the reasons is he wants it to be a, a sideshow. You can continue to be demobilized. Sit at home, yes. put, put yes. a Z on your door, support the war, support your country, be a patriot. And, and the, that deal held like for, for, the, the, the very, for the first you know, almost year. And I Six mean, months. he's obviously like very capable of controlling the flow of information in the country, and that's been a, a buildup over the course of years. So when he feels that confident controlling the mm -hmm. narrative, you know, we are denazifying Ukraine, and the country's going to right. believe who, that. Who could be against that? It's a special military operation to denazify Ukraine. And now, uh, the, the speech just a couple of weeks ago he gave uh, br sort of broadened the scope of it, though, and said this is about the West. This is about us versus this rotting sort of ideology mm -hmm that is creeping onto our land 
from the West. And that's what we're taking a stand against. Um, so it is, you know, I feel like that was a broadening to an extent of the way he was willing to, to frame right. the war. And it's retconning the whole mission too. Because you, you, don't, you don't get to launch a war and then six months into it say that actually we're doing the war for this reason. Well, actually it is a war. Right, well, yeah. and actually it is a war. Yeah. Although uh, you, could, you, could ar- you could argue that that has happened in the past. So if you take the U.S. Civil War, for instance, sure, yeah. that was initially a war to preserve the Union. Mm-hmm. Where, and, and Lincoln and the other you know, Republican leaders are being very clear, this is not, uh, this is not about you know, freeing, you know, it's not about ending slavery. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then in, in the cauldron of the war, it it, be, it it reshapes itself. I don't see any way that this comes across, though, as anything other than a face saving at this point. Like you can't can't lose a war mm-hmm. and, and and then start saying, well, actually, this is a existential war well, for you, you know against Western civilization. You can if you control the flow of information in your country. It's much easier to make the to make the claim that that's what's really happening. But but controlling the flow of information is harder when yes. things are happening inside your borders. Absolutely. Like the fact that w- they immediately acknowledged this mass shooting at this training center. And another thing that's going on inside their borders, uh, if we have footage of this uh, this Ukrainian strike in the Belgorod region. So this is you know, for the the first six months of the war ish, uh, Ukraine, you know, very much refrained from a, attacking, you know, inside Russian territory, outside of you know, forget forget who controls the Donbas or Crimea, right, 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 like inside what everybody understands to be Russia's borders. And he, but here we have, you know, missile strikes hitting a power hitting a, a civilian center again, which which is ugly because if you have civilian strike against civilian strike they hit a they hit a they hit an airport mm-hmm. uh, they hit a they hit a util you know they hit a power utility that's so. yeah the it, it's uh, that okay so th- if you could connect the dots for us between uh, the the first thing we talked about which is these potentially iranian made drones coming in from you know they have a range of something like 1200 plus miles coming into kiev um, what is the sort of connection between A and B there? What does it mean that we're seeing both of these things happen within the same time frame? Well, I think there, there is, Russia is certainly going for kind of maximum pain mm-hmm. on you know to inflict on on Ukraine in order to you know try to pump up domestic support for the war to show that like this is you know we're still capable of of raining destruction down on Ukraine and the and the and the subtle implication is always. And we're holding back, right? Like that's a central component of the Russian messaging, which is that we actually could be doing a lot worse to Ukraine than we are, and you should be grateful that we're not. And and if we're forced to, if we're backed into a corner, we will do much worse, right? And and that's where the nuclear saber saber that's, rattling comes into. That's where it all comes down to. Yeah. At the end of the day, the willingness to deploy, for instance, tactical nuclear weapons, um, and that's why if if you haven't watched Ryan's monologue from Friday about the dire, urgent need for negotiations and our foreign policy establishment's disinterest in actually really meaningfully approaching the negotiating table, go take a look at that. It's really fantastic. And Ryan, uh, took this a, is actually- took a very courageous stand against nuclear war. It was really bold. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, I was surprised to hear Ryan coming out in favor of peace. Yeah, uh, against and not annihilation and dis- Armageddon. Right, yeah, yeah the, the destruction- Controversial the position world. here in Washington. But, it's controversial. But somebody's gotta say it. Somebody had to do it and you yeah. were you were willing to. You rose Long your hand and up. you said, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.